Hello, my name is Anton Creel. I'm the managing partner of the Institute of Trading and Portfolio Management. Today, I'm joined by Jason McDonald, one of our senior trading mentors. And today, we're going to have a chat about Jason's career. Welcome, Jason. Hi, Anton. Good to see you. Good to see you. So, uh, Jason, you've um, been with the Institute now for a year. Uh, you're one of those guys in the market, really, who uh, operated for successfully about 20 years in the market and I guess you're relatively unknown but we obviously know each other I knew of you and due to your successful career and track record we brought you into the Institute to mentor our students um, why don't we uh, start off and go right back to the beginning of your career uh, what happens right at the beginning how did it all begin okay so I came out of university um, in 1992, aged 21, and uh, knew pretty quickly um, when you know going through the milk round process that I wanted to go into investment banking. At that time, wasn't really sure. Um, probably didn't really know actually what every part of an investment bank did, but had an inkling and an idea that trading would be something very exciting and attractive to um, have. You know, a, a greater sort of in-depth look at. Mm. So, did the usual thing of uh, milk round interviews, um, and got an offer from what was then known as Barclays to Zoot Wedbeza W, which is now mm. Barclays Capital. Mm. So they offered me a job as a graduate trainee. Um, and initially, what you do is, um, I'm sure, you know, much like at Goldman Sachs, uh, where you started, you go on a, a three to four month sort of whirlwind tour of the bank mm. looking at uh, different parts of the business and I pretty um, pretty quickly knew that um, I certainly wasn't going to be a corporate financier that you know once you've been on the trading floor mm. and got that kind of excitement um, and you know sort of been part of that really quite in sort of incomparable mm. atmosphere of what a, you know a big trading floor is like that for me um, you know, made my mind up. So I was fortunate enough that I went straight from the rotation onto one of the big uh, proprietary trading desks, um, and that was actually the event driven, the risk arbitrage desk. Yeah. So, um, for you know, those guys out there that don't know what risk arbitrage um, and event driven trading is about, it's um, first of all, it's proprietary trading, so we're trading the bank's own capital. Um, and it's a it's quite a specialised area. Um, the risk arbitrage um, refers to takeover situations, so they can be announced situations that um, are already you know they've been announced by the companies. Mm -hmm. um, and there's what's known as a spread and arbitrage between the the company that's doing the acquiring and the acquiree. That's an announced deal. Um, there's also what's known as rumour trage, so trying to spot companies which might be subjected to takeover activity. Um, and the, the event-driven side was more things like dual-listed companies, so for example, Shell Royal Dutch, Unilever, mm. um, which are both Anglo-Dutch companies that have listings in London and Amsterdam. Um, but the, the shares, once you've X'd out the foreign exchange difference, don't necessarily trade at exactly equivalent levels. And so we would play the spread between the cheap side of the um, the company and, yeah. and the in, in inverted commas expensive side, okay. and so we we'd play the spread. Uh, normally, it would be the PLC was was trading cheap to the Dutch company, yeah. the NV. So we'd be trading um, the rate on on, the, on that sort of spread and discount. Um, other situations that we would look at would be what's known as uh, cash extractions. So that's where you're using. Um, a particular type of option which is called a warrant which is basically a call option and we would trade um, the warrant against the underlying stock um, so normally that would be the cash extraction part is when is normally where you're long of the warrant and you're short of the mm. stock against that mm. um, <coughs> so really that's you know that encapsulates um, 
most of what we did on, on the event driven side and so I was fortunate enough to go straight on to uh, that proprietary training book and I was actually straight in as a number two which was really you know um, quite fortuitous and, and yeah. really beneficial for my career so that's where I started um, at Beza W I moved on um, to Credit Suisse First Boston after that Credit Suisse First Boston actually bought the equities businesses of Barclays so we all migrated over from the equities business of, of Beza W into Credit Suisse First Boston and I then became part of a group known as Modal Capital, which is an, another internal, yeah. um, is actually more like an internal hedge fund at Credit Suisse. Um, and at that point, this was around the late 90s, um, so 97 was when Barclays sold their businesses to CSFB. Mm. Um, at that stage, I was actually given my own book. So previously, I'd been part of a book which was actually, um, at its peak, was about a billion pounds um, in terms of the size of the portfolio. Um, when I was given my own book, um, I was then controlling uh, about a quarter of a billion dollars. And that again was in the event driven arena. Mm. So the thing about event driven is it, it gives you, it makes you very disciplined and very process driven because you have to be aware of, of the sort of minutiae and, and um, small elements of deals that could cause a deal to break. Mm. So that's really a good foundation for then going on to fundamental investing because mm. it means that you've got a real eye for detail. Yeah. So, as I said, you know, moved over to the internal uh, hedge fund at, at CSFB called Modal, uh, where I stayed until um, almost um, exactly coinciding with the um, the implosion of the internet, the yeah. tech boom, which obviously we were both in the market yeah. at the same time um, for for that particular event. Um, which was not, you know, uh, sort of any kind of foresight on my part, just a, a massive coincidence that I actually ended up um, getting headhunted from CSFB to go and set up a, a volatility and event driven hedge fund, oh, which is obviously perfect. quite good timing yeah. Yeah, um, for that. So I went to a company called Mako, yeah. um, which specialised in, specialises still in um, options market making, and the idea there was to set up a, an event driven and volatility hedge fund which I did um, for three and a half years and after that subsequently I went back to proprietary trading at the banks mm. so my career this is then we're into the sort of early double O's yeah. um, I then went back to a German bank called Commerce Bank and joined um, quite a big team there where there were six of us three of whom were the senior traders and we had a couple of analysts and um, a, a sort of Japanese specialist and that was uh, that was a much more fundamentally driven prop book. So now I'm kind of moving away from the event driven side of things yeah. and moving more into the long short yeah. area. And you know, this was mainly specializing in the UK and Europe. Um, but also we had quite a, a flexible mandate there. So, you know, we were getting involved in North America and in the developed markets in Asia. So, you know, Singapore and Hong yeah. Kong, Australia was, was a good place for me in particular, actually. Um, as well as doing um, some quite structured trades in South Africa, yeah. uh, which sounds a bit exotic, but actually South Africa, if you think about it, you know, it's got a very developed stock market, and it's all based on the kind of Anglo-Saxon, you yeah, know, yeah. UK yeah. regulatory regime. So it's actually, you know, really easy market to yeah. um, to transition to. Mm. Um, so. You know, we were running about uh, two to three billion euros at that point um, at Commerce Bank. And then subsequently, I ended up at uh, Lehman Brothers. I'm not sure that we were there at the same time. I think I may have just missed you. Yeah. I think you left just before I came, actually. 06. I came at the beginning of 06. Okay. So. We probably just overlapped by yeah. a month. <laughs> right. Yeah. And that's when you went to JP Morgan, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So um, I was at Lehman Brothers um, only actually for quite a short period, just for a year before I went mm. to uh, a Canadian bank, Toronto Dominion, yeah. where I um, set up uh, another prop, uh, another equity proprietary trading book. Um, I had three guys working under underneath me, including my brother actually, who was my analyst, which is quite interesting. <laughs> yeah, um, and uh, that's that's where I finished my trading career in the city. So that sort of takes you through up until you know 2010. So basically yeah. an 18 year prop trading yeah. career. I consider myself exceptionally fortunate to have been able to spend my entire time trading 
the bank's money and yeah. and the hedge fund shareholders' money rather than you know being in a client facing business, which for me was was not as exciting or as interesting because yeah. the thing about prop trading is that it's you're pitting yourself against the market and yeah. um, you know it's it's there's nowhere to hide. It's it's really simple to work out who's who's performing and who isn't performing because yeah. you've got your P and L. Exactly, and it's not you know you can't sort of say well, it's because we had a good client business, therefore we got lots of flow and we could kind of piggyback yeah. on the back of that. It yeah. is you against yeah. the market. It's so only one way to keep score there. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, and and so you know for me that was just really stimulating. Pure. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously a pretty successful career mm -hmm. over the eighteen years. Um, you obviously traded through a number of cycles, which is. Uh, which is not common, I guess, these days. Um, those cycles are really important, I think, in terms of picking up overall experience and obviously the products that you were exposed to as well during mm -hmm. the time. Give us an insight as to what you believe now with hindsight was for you the most interesting cycle to trade. Undoubtedly, the global financial crisis. So. Just to rewind a little bit, I mean, my career started in 92, finished in 2010. So that takes in the the Fed shock in 94, when the Fed raised interest rates unexpectedly, spooked the markets. Um, even though we were running an event-driven portfolio, that still um, had a marked effect on our performance. And actually, we had a bad year that year. We broke even. Um, then, you know, the obvious next development is the... Um, is, is the whole sort of technology bubble and explosion. Um, so it's interesting that you've identified cycles because there are, obviously there is a there is the business cycle and there are definitely elements of each cycle which are similar. However, if you think about the two that I've just named, they're quite different mm. types of event. Um, and then, you know, you've got the uh, the bear market that resulted from the implosion of the, of the, of the tech bubble, mm. which, effectively went on for three years, um, maybe a bit longer actually, three and a half years. <coughs> um, and then another bull market, mm. and then you know, leading up to the great financial crisis of, mm. uh, which started in 2007. Mm. And so in, this, the short answer to your question is the global financial crisis, but um, there are also some other you know, really large events during, during my career, which I've been fortunate enough to um, you know, to be participating in the markets at that mm. time because you learn something different from each one of those mm. um, crises. And the crises, you know, they're of different magnitudes as well. Um, and obviously they affect um, different parts of economies and different parts of the market. The, obviously the big element with the global financial crisis was it affected everybody. And it was the, the first time in literally decades and decades that the global financial system was actually in grave danger. Mm. So in that respect, you know, both um, an incredible experience, but also actually when we were right in the guts of it and the depths of it, mm. fairly scary as well from, you know, certain aspects. So actually in that, um, during that period, so in fact, when our, our dear old bank Lehman's went under, mm. I was actually, although I was running uh, an equity long short portfolio, um, I was part of what was known as Credit Products Group at Toronto Dominion. Mm. And for those <coughs> people who don't know what that what those uh, words mean, credit is the it it is the debt side of the market, and historically. What banks do is they separate equity, the equities division, from the debt division. Now, I was actually running an equity portfolio within a credit group, um, which meant that actually, first of all, we had great intelligence in terms of the positions that we were able to take in equities ahead of the rest of the equity market. So, for example, I got short the banks very early on, mm. um, particularly the Australian banks on a valuation basis. Um, and in fact, we went too early, and so we actually were losing money on our bank short for the last part of 2007 because we were doing that on the basis of our analysis of, of the banks from an equity perspective, but mm. also on the basis of what we were seeing going on in the credit world 
via the desk that we were mm. sat on and via the, the part of the business that we were inhabiting. Mm. So that gave us a heads up in terms of, you know, we actually were making money when other people were getting carried out basically. Mm. Um, but the scary aspect was because we were part of a credit group, the credit guys were not doing well at all. They were basically stuck in enormous positions mm. which um, became totally illiquid that they basically couldn't get out of and you just watch their P&L gapping down on a day-by-day -day basis and it just at one stage in the sort of um, in the post Lehman period it, it just seemed that you know some of these losses that they were taking could j just would never be stemmed you know they would just never stop of course they did but um, in the meantime you know doing a great deal of wreckage to the business um, and so as an equity participant watching that unfold was both incredibly fascinating but also um, you know, when you realise the implications and you've got people queuing outside Northern Rock just down the road on Moorgate, mm. which you know, of course, because that's in the city and that's mm. where Toronto Dominion is, they're mm. opposite Bloomberg. Um, you know, that's something that, that's not happened in my lifetime. You know, mm. I'm 43 years old. That's something that you would have seen in, in the 1930s. Mm. Certainly, you don't expect to see that in the 21st century yeah. on a you know on a London street. People actually queuing to take their deposits out of Northern Rock. It, it, it's exceptional. Yeah. So, by far, that that particular um, it's not really one event. It's you know, sort of the, 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 that course of events was really the most um, enlightening and and. You know, interesting from a, a trading perspective. Um, it's also, you know, we still haven't, uh, you know, we we haven't actually shrugged off that period. Yeah. Um, we, you know, we're still that story hasn't finished yet. We're still waiting to see what is going to happen. You know, for example, later on in the year when the Fed starts raising rates, yeah. <clears throat> there's still a lot of uncertainty over how this whole thing is going to unwind. So you could argue that we're still in. That you know we're we're in that post GFC world, which is still mm. incredibly fascinating mm. and with a lot of uncertainty. Apart from one thing that we can say is is that you probably want to be long volatility. Yeah. Okay. So you <coughs> came out of the global financial crisis. Okay. Uh, you finished up in two thousand and ten. Yeah. Uh, and then I guess you go home. The eighteen year career in investment banks prop trading has come to an end. Mm. Uh, what did you do in the period between leaving uh, the investment banks and joining the Institute last year? Um, caught up on my sleep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, one of the features of the city is you know, the market opens at eight o'clock London time. So basically everyone's on their desk by latest seven o'clock in the morning. Yeah. So, you know, you're, you're, you're used to a completely different um, body clock, really. I mean, also for me, although I mainly traded Europe and UK, as I mentioned, I, I did a lot of trading in Australia as well, and that's the completely wrong time yeah. uh, in terms of sleep. So basically the phone is right by your bed the whole time, and, you, and you're getting called literally in the middle of the night by your brokers in Australia, yeah. um, particularly when, you know, there are sort of unforeseen events happening in the market and, yeah. you know, decisions need to be made. So, you know, not being flippant, actually caught up on my sleep. Um, I did, you know, it's very, it's addictive. Mm. So, you know, when I started at Barclays, we had the largest trading floor bar none mm. in the city. And you know that that those it's kind of like a pressure cooker environment, and you're sat there surrounded by screens, and you know some noisy individuals, some not so noisy, but it's uh, it's a really quite indescribable environment for people that haven't actually been on the trading floor, and so getting used to you know not getting up when it's still dark most of the time, yeah. not going in and you know having a whole sort of host of people basically feeding you information, the yeah. brokers ringing you up, going into your morning meeting to discuss what risk you've got on, mm -hmm. to discuss what we think is going to happen today and how we're going to play it. Suddenly, when that's not there, it's you yeah. actually kind of feel almost a bit useless, actually. Yeah. I mean, I've still obviously got my own personal portfolio, but yeah. managing that is not the same as managing institutional money, where sure. you're literally in you've got information overload it's fantastic you know you're sat at the center of all this 
great flow of information in fact you've actually got too much of it you're almost kind of you know drowning in it yeah so and that for that to suddenly stop it's just it's very strange so initially <coughs> you know I need to sort of I'm one of those people that needs to have a bit of structure so mm. um, you know great big piece of that structure was taken away obviously when you're not going into the office so um, I literally just had to find a lot of other ways to fill my time and now it's actually it, it's sort of a question of actually I, d I don't know where all the time goes now but mm. initially you kind of sat there thinking well the phone's not ringing mm. um, you know Jesus it's eight o'clock what's going on but mm. of course you're not in the same environment sure. so um, you know I th I did a lot of things I you know I did some property projects yeah. um, I did a little bit of, uh, of corporate advisory business because during the course of my career also um, got involved at a certain point um, with some of the smaller cap companies um, on you know some of the aim listed stuff yeah um, which put me in a different kind of network so through that network um, I got some advisory business and corporate advisory business um, <clears throat> I spent a lot of time flying as in actually flying myself because yeah. I started to learn to fly when I was at TD Okay. Um, and so I finished my pilot's license and then I've done a, a shed load of flying, cool. uh, private flying since. Nice. Um, you know, lots of really good tours around Europe and then over to Ireland, around the Baltic and up to Scotland, all kinds of things. So yeah. that's been, you know, really fantastic for me. Um, and uh, I've got quite a high maintenance wife who likes to travel. So um, that's also um, I feel part of the, the time as well. But basically, I suppose, just become a lot more entrepreneurial yeah um, that's the that's the big difference is you know you don't have that structure it's, it wasn't a nine-to-five structure but it was still a structure yeah so it's um, you no know, it's a lot more varied now and of course now that I'm involved with the Institute as well that's given me a completely different element because teaching in itself is actually a different skill yeah um, and I have to say you know, it's 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 reinvigorated my passion for the markets. It's uh, obviously, you know, having had a such a long career in financial markets, you can't be anything but enthusiastic about engaging with the markets. But the teaching gives you a totally different element because it's just fantastic to take some guys who, by the time they get to me, they've already done the PTM, so they have a certain base level. Of knowledge mm. but you're really taking almost um, you know kind of a rough diamond and yeah. polishing it up through the mentoring process so we get them from a situation where they've got the knowledge base but they're probably very nervous about pulling the trigger and you know within two to three months these guys are confidently putting positions on understanding why they're putting positions on understanding the risks that they're taking because it is about measured risk taking mm. you can't you know it's that risk reward trade-off yeah and watching these guys basically fly yeah and it's you know even though the mentoring course can be three months or six months we never actually lose contact with these guys you know we're always going to have the door is always open I've still you know, I'm still in contact with the very first guys that yeah. I mentored and you know we've always got information and questions going backwards and forwards sure. and it's just awesome to see where they've come from and yeah. where they are now in in such a short period of time yeah so obviously uh, finishing up the career in the city <coughs> uh, retirement was good to you You've now joined the institute. Yeah, um, we got in contact uh, a year ago again, and you've come in and you've obviously mentored a lot of guys in the last year. Uh -huh. um, retail traders, when they start out, what do you find from your experience? Uh, retail traders struggle with what? What? What do they when they start out? what difficulties do you think they face and how do they overcome them? How do you help them overcome these difficulties? I think it, it's basically twofold. Um, one of the really basic things is the PTM is really comprehensive and um, it's a methodology. Mm. So, but it actually requires quite a lot of time devotion. Mm. So time management is, is definitely an issue. But the, re the really big thing is the process because almost all of the the guys that come to us um, 
you know, a lot of them have actually tried trading before. Um, unfortunately, most of them not successfully. Mm. And a large part of that is down to the fact that, you know, understandably, they've not been taught a process or they haven't learned a process. Um, and so what the PTM does and then what the mentoring continues to do is, is in part a process and a methodology. And so it's adopting that process and getting into that way of approaching things and mm. thinking about um, everything that they, they, that they need to focus on. It's about getting them into that kind of routine and habit. And mm. once they've got that, that's when, you know, when the confidence comes because they know, they understand what the process is, why um, we structure the process in the way that we do. Mm. And they can see how that feeds through to generating a portfolio mm. and, and good returns and good risk management. Mm. So really it's, it's, it's those two things, the time management aspect and, and getting hold of the process. Yeah, so I guess a lot of obviously retail traders, they're not giving up their day jobs or not <coughs> closing down their businesses if they're self-employed and then mm -hmm. uh, just starting a whole new career in something that they don't know if they're really any good at or if they like necessarily. So. To begin with, retail traders, um, they're still running their lives in the same way, but I guess trying to fit in this new skill set, this new hobby, if you like, yeah. of yeah. learning the financial markets, how to trade, how to manage portfolios successfully. Mm -hmm. But I guess trying to fit that kind of eight to 12 hour minimum weekly commitment into their diaries and focusing on all the right things. Yeah. Um, so that's obviously something that they struggle with to begin with and then get used to after, as you mentioned, a couple of months. What do you find retail traders uh, are good at? Because actually earlier you mentioned something quite interesting about being on the trading floors. Mm -hmm. You're sitting in this kind of <coughs> vortex of information flow. Mm -hmm. And the way the market's actually evolved, the internet has actually been the great leveler. Yeah. And retail traders mm -hmm. now, five years on, uh, yeah. after you left that side of the industry, <coughs> can actually access all of this information now. They just mm -hmm. kind of need to know where to look and how to interpret it. Is there any advantage or of retail traders better or good at anything uh, that you think compared to the professional side they can actually leverage. It's, a, it's a, an interesting situation actually, because if you think about it, you know, when I started to, uh, you know, I think the life market wasn't even screen traded, mm. but it was still open outcry. Yeah. So, you know, we've gone from having to pick up a telephone to speak to a broker to put an order in, to, you know, you can sit in your underpants at home mm. as a retail guy and you've got all this fantastic connectivity um, and information at your fingertips. So actually, there's almost been a slight role reversal because we were talking about the, the information that you're at the center of when you're working at an investment bank. However, what's happened in the last five years, partly because of the, the crisis, is that the biggest growth aspect of investment banking these days is compliance and yeah. regulatory stuff. Yeah. So actually, prop trading has been severely curtailed by the regulators, mm. and on the other side of it, for the retail guys, mm. you know, because of the of, of the advances in technology and obviously particularly in internet penetration and speeds and everything, mm. um, you're actually able as a retail guy to access a lot more information, almost um, as much information as you would be able to access mm. um, at an investment bank, except mm. you're not encumbered by all of the kind of internal compliance rules and mm. you know things like restricted lists, sure. um, which is basically a list of stocks that a trader's not allowed to trade for various compliance reasons. Yeah. So of course, as a retail trader, you don't have any of those restrictions. Mm. So and particularly in the developed markets of the West, so obviously Europe, UK, North mm. America, um, you can actually, if you know where to look and find the information, yeah. as a retail guy, you can now get it. You know, the, the sort yeah. of barriers to entry have actually sort of come down. So that is actually a big advantage. And I guess this provides um, a, a platform <coughs> now for retail traders where they've actually got great flexibility to go out 
generate ideas and actually have access to a huge opportunity set. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and obviously this is part of what we do yeah. with the PTM and the mentoring in terms of we show people how to find it, where to find it, and free. You know, it's, yeah. it doesn't cost you. It's, it's freely available, as in widely available and no cost. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, that's, and that is a tremendously uh, empowering thing. And, it, and, and actually, it, it, um, that gives a, a retail trader the ability to, in some respects, emulate what we did as professionals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the whole idea, isn't it? Yeah, so what I find amazing, actually, uh, this flexibility that retail traders have and all the guys who come through the mentoring programs, mm. It kind of uh, creates a foundation that enables these guys to go out and generate ideas that wouldn't necessarily be generated by guys who are sitting in this closed environment <coughs> at investment banks or even at hedge funds. Mm -hmm. um, this is obviously something they're quite good at. Um, what's what's your experience of that? Yeah, I think that um, I. Mean, First of all, this is probably going to sound a bit trite, but I haven't found I haven't had a single student yet who I thought at the beginning of this process, this is going to be a difficult person to teach. So they all, you know, every single one, and they and they come from a whole range of different walks of life. So you know, they're across the planet in all kinds of different countries, geographies. They, you know, we've got students, we've got retired surgeons, we've got helicopter um, mechanics. We've got, you know, all a, sort of a, a, an enormous um, spectrum of different types of people. Mm. But the one thing that they've all got in common, apart from obviously the desire to learn how to trade properly and professionally, is that um, a lot of them, they're, they're just, they're really original thinkers. So yeah. once we've got the process imparted to them, they can actually come up with some really surprising results yeah. by virtue of following through the thought process and, and the, um, the sort of construction and, and management that we've taught them. But they come up with some quite almost off the wall conclusions, which you, you wouldn't necessarily see amongst even you know some of the professional traders that we've worked with. So clearly, yeah. uh, obviously, Goldman's is a quality name. Yeah. But I've worked at um, quite a few different places, and the range of um, skills amongst people that I've worked you know next to or in the same room as or on the same desk as is quite varied so you know there are obviously some really sharp people in the city as we know but there are also some pretty average ones yeah and so what is really amazing is to see some retail guys coming through mm. and actually coming up with really good top quality ideas that you mm. might not even see generated on you know one of the old desks that we worked on, or you know mm. one of the sort of trading pitches that mm. um, you know we sat next to at, at the bank. So it's a you know the I think the management and the understanding of how to use the information which is yeah. out there that we show them you know how to obtain is really impressive. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's um, it's something that I've actually been quite shocked by, you know, putting myself out there in the retail <laughs> market in front of lots of people like you said, across a broad spectrum of disciplines um, and how these guys have generated such good forward-looking original ideas. That is key, forward-looking. Yeah. That, that's a key word that you've yeah. just said there. That, um, that maybe even I or you wouldn't have even generated. Yeah. You know, it's pretty amazing how you impart this process and knowledge and the results, they come back with Absolutely. as good a results as you could yeah. actually create yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so this is obviously something they're very good at. Um, now you're public speaking as well, but like you're going out now every month in London, <coughs> where we are now today, mm -hmm. and uh, you're standing in front of large audiences now every month. Obviously, very different to being sat, sat on the floor, yep, blinkered. Skill set. Um, when these guys are coming to seminars, they're obviously free seminars. We open the door and just allow anybody to come in, mm -hmm. and you show them. Uh, a structure in the financial markets that allows retail traders to build their knowledge on. Um, when these guys are coming to the seminars, what are they? What have you picked up on in terms of what they're really looking for? Well, the majority of them um, 
actually don't want to be professional traders. You know, there are some obviously that come along who are yeah. thinking about possibly um, joining a hedge fund or working at an investment bank at some stage. But the massive majority of them are actually coming because they understand, for example, the massive elephant in the room, which is pension provision. Yeah. And they understand that it's woefully inadequate yeah. and they want to do something about it. Yeah. And obviously they need to, to do that. You've got to be able to manage your financial assets. Yeah. So most of them are coming along because they, they don't, they've got an idea that they need to do something about their financial situation, but mm. they're not sure what they need to do and, and mm. how to go about it. So that's, you know, one big commonality. Another one is, and, and this is where, um, you know, I, I guess society is, is slightly failing people, um, is because on the one hand, you know, governments, politicians, they're never going to tell, they're never going to give people the bad news mm. of, you know, really how tragic the pension situation is for people. Mm. Um, and they're leaving people ignorant. So one mm. of the biggest factors is actually, of course, we want to educate people um, and we want to show them our course. But, but one of the big things about the seminars is actually just enlightening people and showing them how retail guys in particular fit into mm. the sort of financial infrastructure mm. and ch showing them, demonstrating that that infrastructure um, is slightly misleading, you know, because mm -hmm. it's not there basically to empower them mm. and once they understand that they can empower themselves but the infrastructure is not set up to do that for them it's mm. actually set up to make corporates profits mm. Mm -hmm. um, so once we show them where potential conflicts of interest lie and they mm -hmm. understand that then that mm. gives them the ability to to basically go away and learn how to be proper professional investors mm. and understand how that fits in with the sort of financial ecosystem, yeah. and that's so that's is, that's one of the really big things is, is there's a there's a, a, a real ignorance of unfortunately yeah. um, how trading platforms work, mm -hmm. why they're there, mm. what brokers actually do, and mm. you know what their kind of raison d'être is, mm. um, and so that's you know something that we really try and get across in the seminars yeah. is, is is just to sort of give people a bit of a um, uh, a pointer and, and, and a sort of a a check so mm. that they really understand mm. um, what this infrastructure is about and what it's there for and okay. how they can then go on to use it for their own benefit okay. but there's a there's a big hole there in terms of people's knowledge so they're mm. you know they're not aware of um, all these as I say conflicts of interest but I think they I think <coughs> they kind of know there's a problem <coughs> but they yeah. might not know what exactly they the don't know exactly what it is, is. They, yeah. they, can, they kind of know in their gut there's an issue yeah because obviously they they've gone into the financial markets with the idea that they're going to build their own pension, mm. uh, build a pot for themselves, but their P&L tells them dif different. That yes. it, it's coming back as, as yeah. negative. Yeah. So they understand there's a problem, but they can't quite put their finger on it. Yeah, and of course that, you know, that first step is actually a really important step yeah. to recognize that you have an issue yeah. and that something needs to be done about it. Sure. Because obviously some people, a lot of people don't necessarily take the message that losses Sure. continuous losses give them unfortunately yeah. and so they end up in, in really bad situations but of course at least if you've taken the time to come to the seminar you know that there's something to be addressed yeah, yeah, and you're yeah. taking the first step to try and address it okay so cool you're um you're obviously inside the institute now and helping all of these guys in the best way possible mm -hmm. adding a lot of value and uh i think it's been a really interesting conversation having you down and uh, I'm going to see you in the Caribbean in a month's time. And we've got 16 more guys coming onto the mentoring program. And I think the next year or two is looking really exciting. Can't wait, mate. Thanks for coming down.